Welcome once again to Nothing More Beautiful, which is our pilgrimage together through the great and beautiful truths of the Catholic faith. In this, our second session, we continue to explore the beauty of the human person, created by God and redeemed in Jesus Christ. Our focus this evening is the theology of the body, one of the great legacies left to the church by Pope John Paul II. But now we pause and we ask our loving Father to prepare our hearts and our minds for a new encounter with his son this evening by offering together our nothing more beautiful prayer. For this, I invite you to stand. Heavenly Father, we come before you in praise and thanksgiving, for you have called us to be your own. You gave us your word to bring us truth and your spirit to make us whole. Through them, we come to know the beauty that is you. Draw us to a new encounter with Jesus, your son. Deepen our love for his church. Help us to embrace anew the beauty of our faith all of its riches. Empower us to see there is nothing more beautiful than our relationship with you, so that we may reflect to others your image in which we have been created. We pray that rooted and grounded in your love and through the healing power of the cross of your Son, we may be strengthened for mission by your Holy Spirit. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord, um, I invite you to be seated. The human body in God's creative design. This is the mystery that Archbishop Richard Smith has invited us to reflect on prayerfully tonight. I do not use the term mystery lightly. In faith, mystery is a truth so profound that we will never completely grasp it. Mystery is a gift to be lived into at ever greater depth and lightened by revelation. The lived body is not merely a chance mutation in an unfolding universe. Rather, it has been revealed that divine loving intent is involved in the design and creation of the human body, male and female. Whatever may have preceded this during billionful years of preparation, and only in Jesus Christ has the full potential of the human body been realized exceedingly beautiful, beyond our limited understanding of beauty. Think with me for a moment on the wonder of the human body. It centers and locates a person in the universe. Sometimes it's described as a midway point in the material universe, a living presence. In size, we're somewhere between subatomic particles and the macro galaxies that hurtle outward through space. Not static, lived bodies are in constant interchange with the larger material universe. I remember reading in a biology textbook that an electron from the page I was reading might now be at the far reaches of the Milky Way. Lovers tell one another there is stardust in the beloved's eyes. And that's true. Not only in death, but also in life, we need to remember and wonder that we are dust, and unto dust we will return. Precious dust, destined for transformation and resurrection. And as we look down at the earth beneath our feet, we should marvel. In creative design, what seems only dark, inert soil may, through seed and water, blossom in vibrant color and be taken into our bodies as carrots or beans 
or come through our bodily eyes as daisies or mountain laurel. The wonder is, only by these being taken into us bodily can they become plant and animal life, participants in conscious willed praise of the Creator. Tiar de Chardin once observed that our bodies are not part of the universe that we possess totally. They are the whole of the universe that we possess partially. Some soil is transformed into wheat, crushed, shaped into hosts, and then transubstantiated into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. As a poet says in a related context, if you were God, would you have thought about that? Pope Benedict XVI notes that in biblical language, the word body, as in, quote, this is my body, denotes the whole person in whom the body and spirit are indivisibly one. This is my body, therefore, means this is my whole person, existent in bodily form. What we learn from that is said next, which is given for you. It's important to take care in speaking of our bodies. We do not have a body or own it. The body is our entire being and presence made outwardly visible, capable of relationship. And so we have to ask, for what reason such extravagance? What does that mean? And perhaps no one has reflected more intensely on the meaning and privilege of the lived body than the servant of God, Pope John Paul II. Prior to his being elected pope, he knew from experience how the body was understood and misunderstood and treated during tumultuous decades of the 20th century. From the burning bodies in the ovens of Auschwitz to the burned out bodies of youth through so-called sexual and drug liberations. And on the other hand, John Paul knew the dignity accorded the human body during those same decades. The dogmatic declaration of Our Lady's assumption, body and soul, into eternal life. The constitutions of the Second Vatican Council and Humani Vitae, the landmark encyclical of Pope Paul VI concerning human sexuality and marriage. In 129 public audiences from 1979 to 1984, Pope John Paul II laid foundations for a theology of the body. He did not invent a new meaning of body. Rather, he brought into new expression the richest insights concerning the meaning of human life received from scripture tradition, and magisterial teaching, and he applied them to the most urgent issues of contemporary life. Like Christ, John Paul said it's essential to look to the beginning, to find what has been revealed concerning God's intent in creating mankind as male and female. That familiar Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, provides an entry point for receiving God's intent and creative design for human beings. It's so familiar. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. What can it mean to be created bodily in the image of God? To enter deeper into this mystery, it's essential to ask, well, if we are created in the image of God, 
who is God and what is the inner life of God. And we're not left in darkness regarding that either. And yet, we'll, neither will we ever totally grasp the immense dignity and mystery of such a calling. As the church's liturgy celebrates at Christmas, it was in the fullness of time that the eternal word became incarnate. The second person of the Trinity came personally to overcome the human long separation from God. And through and in Jesus Christ, we have received in person the revelation that God's intent and creative design for humanity is ultimate union with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is an impenetrable mystery of love that we as bodied persons are intended for union with the divine communion of persons. In Gaudium et Spes, the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World of Vatican II, it is written, for by his incarnation, he, the Son of God, has in a certain way united himself with each man. He worked with human hands, he thought with a human mind, he acted with a human will and with a human heart he loved. Born of the Virgin Mary, he has truly been made one of us, like us in all things except sin. Particularly at the Last Supper, Jesus interwove prayer to the Father with intimate revelation concerning the inner life of the Trinity as personal relations of mutual, perfect self-gift. This then is every person's fundamental vocation, to image bodily the divine persons who are forever united in loving, mutual self-gift. This is the incalculable dignity of what it means to be human, man and woman. Theologically, the word chosen to describe the inner life of God as revealed is perichoresis. It's a Greek word that has a twofold meaning, making it particularly apt for describing what Jesus revealed of the inner relational life of God. Perichoresis means that simultaneously in Trinitarian life, there's a mutual indwelling within one another and a penetration of and a being penetrated by the others. At the Last Supper, for example, Jesus spoke personally of this. He said, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be in us. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so St. Paul did not hesitate to remind the early church in Corinth, that small Christian community working out its identity in a raunchy port city given to God and goddess worship. He wrote, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Writing much later, John in his gospel relates that when Jesus was challenged for cleansing the temple, he told his accusers, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up but he spoke of the temple of his body. 
A temple is the dwelling place of God's presence, a place of encountering God's presence, of worship marked by fruitful gift giving. If we are in the state of grace, our bodies are living temples, mobile homes where divine persons dwell. It's impossible in a brief reflection tonight to plumb the depth of insight that Pope John Paul II articulated in his audiences, which probed the meaning of our existence made in God's image. Perhaps tasting even one of those audiences together tonight may awaken a desire to read and reflect on all of them. I quote from his audience of January 9th, 1980. There is a strong link between the mystery of creation as a gift that springs from divine love and that beatifying beginning of man's existence as male and female in the whole truth of their bodies and of their sexes, which is the simple and pure truth of communion between persons. When the first man exclaims at the sight of the woman, she is flesh of my flesh and bone from my bones, he simply affirms the human identity of both. And by exclaiming this, he seems to say, look, a body that expresses the person. And the Pope goes on to say, the body which expresses femininity for masculinity and vice versa masculinity for femininity manifests it through gift as the fundamental characteristic of personal existence. This is the body, a witness to creation as a fundamental gift and therefore a witness to love as the source from which this same giving springs. Masculinity, femininity, namely sex, is the original sign of a creative donation and at the same time the sign of a gift that man, male, female, becomes aware of as a gift. This is the meaning with which sex enters into theology of the body." Unquote. Capacity for true self-gift, then, is the ultimate meaning of the human body. And John Paul goes on to call this bodily self-gift spousal. Our catechism affirms that God is love and lives a mystery of personal loving communion. In fact, the Catechism says, there is inscribed in the humanity of man and woman the vocation and thus the capacity and responsibility of love and communion. Further, the Catechism affirms the importance of accepting one's sexuality. Quote, everyone man and woman should acknowledge and accept their sexual identity. Physical, moral, and spiritual difference and complementarity are oriented towards the goods of marriage and the flourishing of family life. Notice that the Catechism does not equate entire personal identity with sexuality, rather Acknowledging and accepting sexual identity as male or female means healthy integration of the person. Beginning with audience 24, John Paul began to apply the integral vision of mankind to marriage and celibacy, aware that this calling is lived out in a sin-conditioned but redeemed world. Neither John Paul nor the whole church are naive concerning challenges which accompany authentic living out of our spousal meaning of the lived body. Pope John Paul's series of audiences culminates in basic insights of Humani Vitae, the encyclical which he said impelled him to develop a theology of the body. 
as Jesus Christ exemplifies, mutual self-gift is sacrificial. It takes commitment and requires truth, fidelity, and forgiveness. And the very design of the human body manifests its spousal quality and invites communion of persons. For example, unlike the animals, human beings are upright and our eyes are designed for communion with the eyes of others. They invite encounter, face-to-face -face communication. So it's understandable that John Paul began that series of audiences dealing with contemporary challenges to spousal meaning in a sin-conditioned world by reflecting on a saying of Jesus found in Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to desire her in a reductive way, explains John Paul, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. John Paul said this is of key significance for theology of the body and that every word of Christ has such a vast import. Ethos, or ethics, John Paul said, means entering into the depth of the norm itself descends into the interior of man, the subject of morality. And it's always a matter of the total body person who is called to truthful living in thought, word, and deed. This is difficult to hear in a society that tends to view a person as divisible among thoughts, desires, choices, and bodily activity. Adultery stems from within. Desire, John Paul noted, quote, as an interior act expresses itself through the sense of sight, that is, with a look, as in the case of David and Bathsheba. And some people were aghast when in a later audience John Paul said, quote, adultery in the heart is not committed only because the man looks in this way at a woman who is not his wife, but precisely because he looks in this way at a woman. Even if he were to look this way at the woman who is his wife, he would commit the same adultery in the heart. We are, as it were, woven of one piece, body and soul, inner heart, an outward act. And what both Christ and John Paul were describing is the loss of integrity of love that's involved in lust. To lust is to desire the use of another for one's pleasure in a manner that treats the other as an object. So that what John Paul was indicated by saying that a man could commit adultery in the heart regarding his wife was that such desire does not stem from faithful spousal self-gift, but is the desire to satisfy a carnal urge apart from committed relationship, a taking rather than an act of mutual self-gift. Opinion ad pages in the United States press ridiculed the Pope's words because of the inability to understand this truth of the whole person and the meaning of spousal love in and through the body. One writer opined that maybe men in Italy did not lust for their wives, but in the U.S. it was different. One said, if you can't lust for your wife, for whom can you lust? What John Paul was touching upon is the sacredness of marital mutual self-gift. So that more than a person casually walking down the street or a woman seated in a bar, a spouse enduring the look of lust from a partner 
It was a degradation that touches to the interior heart. There is immense sadness in marriage if lust masquerades as love, and there is no effort or desire to change that. It's difficult, and especially in our day, to exaggerate the importance of the gift of sight. As an inner city pastor where children knew much loneliness and abuse, Father Raymond Ellis used to tell the children in a First Communion class as he looked intently upon them eye to eye, when we receive Jesus in communion, we also receive one another. And you, these children, are already within me because you've come into me through my eyes. Such is the beauty of loving sight. And the obverse is also true. Pornographic addiction is one of the greatest causes of personal and marital dissolution today. It sabotages the very meaning of the human body, sexuality, and marriage. What is taken in through the eyes, specifically invited through the eyes, touches the inner person and can vilify the heart. As mentioned earlier, Pope John Paul saw the great significance of the encyclical Humani Vitae. Many have heard about it. Many have never read Humani Vitae or come to know how it supports the integrity and dignity of marital love and its fruitfulness while taking into account the difficulties presented to marital truthfulness in contemporary culture. We've just marked the 40th anniversary of Humani Vitae, but its message and statement of doctrinal principles remains as valid as the day when it was issued. Entitled Of Human Life, the encyclical addresses in its opening lines, quote, the most serious duty of transmitting human life for which married persons are the free and responsible collaborators of God the Creator. From the outset, it states that while this is a source of great joy, it can also present, quote, not a few difficulties and distress. The encyclical enumerates societal changes and pressures such as rapid growth in world population, the temptation of authorities to take radical measures in this regard, pressures relating to work, housing, economic concerns, the changing circumstances for women in society, and the kind of value and appreciation for conjugal love in marriage and the meaning of conjugal acts in relation to love. John, it was Pope Paul VI who said, new questions keep arising, and they include the harmony and mutual fidelity between spouses concerning the regulation of birth. Doctrinal principles taken up in Humani Vitae, like those which John Paul cited, stem from the total vision of the human person. And they express the meaning of responsible parenthood with respect for the nature and purpose of the conjugal act. In Article 12 of Humani Vitae, there is succinctly stated what Paul VI termed a teaching often set forth by the magisterium, founded upon the inseparable connection willed by God and enabled to be broken by man on his own initiative between the two meanings of the conjugal act, the unitive meaning, meaning and the procreative meaning. Pope Paul VI expressed his belief that people of his day would be, quote, particularly capable of seizing the deeply reasonable and human character of this fundamental principle we know, sadly, that has not been the general response. In contraception, the body is used to simulate the truth of authentic and free self-gift. 
bodily, in the most intimate act of intercourse. Contracepting spouses render mutual self-gift infertile in some manner. To enter a spouse's body sheathed against interchange or assured that whatever bodily self-gift received is rendered sterile devastates a most intimate expression of marital love. Contraception may seem to solve a problem, but it recalls an observation of world planner Buckminster Fuller, who said in a universal context, when we don't know how to solve a problem, we kill. In this case, it's a killing of truthfulness of love acted out bodily. Anglican Bishop Arthur Vogel said of the body, it allows us to say what we mean and mean what we say. Humani Vitae shows deep concern for spouses who need responsibly to regulate the number of births within a marriage. If intercourse, it, in intercourse, infecund periods and be surely responsibly used if done with respect for the order established by God. That differs from contraception. As Paul VI wrote, it's the difference between legitimate use of a natural disposition and impeding the development of natural processes. How important that the principles of this landmark encyclical be known by those preparing for sacramental marriage and for those who face a crucial need to regulate the number of children to be received in their family. Like all other aspects of honest, mutual self-gift, this involves always ongoing growth in understanding sexuality, faithful patience, and sacrificial love. And precious are the couples who serve as teachers of natural family planning. All of us live out the splendor of our human bodies in a sin-conditioned world where concupiscence is fed not only by human weakness, but by blatant messages and legal decisions that disfigure the beauty of God's creative design. You know them. You recognize them. This moment of history calls in the church for a renewed John the Baptist spirit, crying out in the wilderness of contemporary values the truth of the body person. This wilderness is howling with pornographic imagery as increasingly replacing with what is real with what is only virtual and changeable at whim. And many commercials treat sexuality as a force that can only be controlled from outside a person or couple through pharmaceutical or surgical interventions in which the conjugal act is often termed a performance. The beauty we've been reflecting upon can only be sustained when spouses and those vowed in celibacy take responsibility for the truthfulness of personal self-gift. This requires work. And the virtue of chastity, which the Catechism describes as the successful integration of sexuality within the person and thus the inner unity of man in his bodily and spiritual being. Many find it difficult to understand how a person vowed in celibacy or an unmarried person can be spousal in body. It may help to realize that even for the most ardent lovers in marriage, actual physical intercourse involves only a limited portion of life and time. And yet, all of life is intended as loving self-gift and every relation beyond one's spouse is also called to be life-giving in ways that are appropriate. 
Sometimes we come to know this truth in ways we never could have imagined. A few months ago, the husband and father of a family in our area blessed us with such a witness. After several days of intense rain, he was working outside with the youngest of his seven sons, a young man 20 years, 21 years of age with Down syndrome. There's a septic pool on their land. And in the course of their work, the sodden ground gave way underneath the sun and he plunged into the septic field. To save him from drowning, the father dove in after him. And I don't understand how these systems work, but I've been told that the father had to move his son's body sideways, submerged in the toxic waste in order to reach an opening. He did this. And then standing below the surface, he held his son up so the young man's head could rise above the waste field and be rescued, and the father drowned. He had never dreamed that this would be his moment of most intense, life-giving love in his body. Total self-gift in one flesh with his spouse. It was not beautiful as we usually think of beauty, but it was the Father's defining spousal act, culminating all spousal life-giving moments he'd known with his wife and family, the children whose bodies they carried, she in her womb and he in his dying arms. May each of us be blessed in the unique beauty of our own bodies in whatever way we are called to be total self-gift. have been asked to share with you how the beauty of the gospel, particularly as it finds expression in John Paul II's Theology of the Body, has inspired and guided us in our personal and family lives. This has afforded us an opportunity to reflect upon God's love for us, his many blessings, and his continuous presence in our lives at every step along the way. Teresa and I have been married for almost 33 years. We have 14 children, eight daughters, six sons. Our oldest son is turning 32, and our youngest is nine. Six of our children are married. One is engaged. One is discerning a religious vocation. And six remain at home with us. We have 13 grandchildren born so far with 
Six more to be born in the next few months. <laughs> Including our daughter Angela's twin boys who are due any moment now. <laughs> We've lived in Pembroke, Ontario, near Ottawa, for the past 11 years, where I practice medicine, specializing in psychiatry, and Therese is a lawyer practicing family law. Few of us understand as we approach the altar to give ourselves to each other in holy matrimony the magnificence and full meaning of our vocation. We were no exception. 33 years ago, we were a young engaged couple on the threshold of our life together. We were filled with the worldliness typical of our generation. We had little experience in self-sacrifice and little insight into the power of divine providence. But what we lacked in maturity, we made up for by the grace of God in sincerity. Like other young wedding couples, Mike and I had hearts for each other. When we pronounced our vows to be faithful to each other in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love and honor one another all the days of our life, we grasped at some basic level that this signified a great mystery, a union reflective of that between Christ and his bride, the church, a oneness of flesh, mind, heart, and soul. 33 years later, we continue to probe the meaning of this mystery. It will take more than a lifetime to exhaust the gift of self it summons from us. But God is so gracious. He takes what we offer, little as it is, and he multiplies it as he did the loaves and the fishes, filling us with every good thing. Years later, we are profoundly aware that this God of abundance continues to fill us with every good thing to transform us and draw him to himself. In our lives, nothing has been more beautiful than this. In 1968, Mike and I were 13 years old. We would not meet for several years, but we shared a milieu. We, we attended school a block apart in an affluent town just outside of Toronto. It was a time of race riots and anti-war demonstrations. Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated that year. Nixon and Trudeau were elected. The Vietnam War raged on. Northern Ireland was erupting into civil war. The Cold War hung like a frozen cloud over international relations. The world held its breath as the first man stepped onto the surface of the moon. The pill was now in widespread use, and an equally widespread revolution of sexual views and practices quickly followed. Divorce became common. Abortion was soon to be legalized. Femini feminism and the new left were burgeoning movements. Time magazine asked on a famous cover, is God dead? It was a time of intense change and turmoil. It was to this restless world that Pope Paul VI issued his prophetic Humanae Vitae, the papal encyclical on human life, which confirmed the Church's constant teaching against artificial birth control, provoked, provoked an immediate outcry and the most public and widespread dissent against Catholic teaching in recent times. Mike and I were old enough to be aware of the tumult. I was the second oldest child in a large family. I adored my baby sisters, and I felt very keenly the ridicule and condemnation of large families that sometimes accompanied the debate. It made a profound impression upon me. Mike and I met in our final year of high school and dated periodically through university. Eventually, we fell deeply in love. In accordance with the times, we were both relatively uncatechized. But there was one thing we came to know and love, 
Humanae Vitae. It was there in those prophetic pages that we had our marriage preparation. There we learned that God himself in the Trinitarian mystery of his life is the model of spousal love. There we discovered that we are gift to each other and that this gift is total and irrevocable and that we cannot find ourselves except through the sincere gift of self. We were assured that this love, freely given, would survive the joys and sorrows of daily life and would not only survive but would grow so that we would become, in a way, one heart and one soul. Finally, we learned that marriage and conjugal love are fruitful, that they are, by their nature, ordained towards procreation and the education of children, who are their supreme gift. As we prepared to wed, Teresa and I realized that what the church held out to us regarding human sexuality and marriage was very different than many messages current at the time. We were surrounded then, as now, by a culture which was often narcissistic. We were indoctrinated with an idea of sexuality based on a superficial and exploitive view of the body divorced from the person. The more I love Therese, the more I desired to discard this distorted image. I wanted to be good to her and to treat her with dignity and tenderness. This was all God needed to lead me, and I was led to Humanae Vitae. Some years later, Pope John Paul would beautifully illuminate the Church's teaching in his Theology of the Body. But the essential elements were already clear in Humanae Vitae. And it was to us a light and a rock in times that were often dark and shifting. What then is this gift of persons of which the, the church speaks? How do we give the mutual gift of ourselves to each other? These were not questions, I must confess, that burned within me as a young man. But after I met Therese and came to know her better, faint embers of interest began to take hold and I wanted the answers to these questions. Humanae Vitae provided the answers. I began to see that Therese was made in the image and likeness of God, that she was God's beloved little girl. I wanted to be good for her and give myself completely to her. Guided by Humanae Vitae, I understood that the sacrament of matrimony was the way I could make this gift of myself to her. I wanted my gift to be total. I grew up with a strong belief in fidelity and permanence in marriage. My parents taught me that. But as I came to understand that God had created Therese, this unique person, this beautiful woman, I deeply understood that marriage is forever. My total gift was to be an irrevocable gift. Therese and I chose Genesis chapter 2 as the first reading on our wedding day. This one, at last, is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. Jesus confirmed that this is an unbreakable union of two lives when he told the Pharisees, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, they are, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. We were, by the grace of God, able to see that what the church offered us was true and beautiful. Young and unprepared as we were, Teresa and I put our hearts and minds and strength into this teaching. We embraced what we recognized as true and promised that we would always live it. We had some sense that God would provide the necessary grace, and he has. Through the years, as we've waded through the revelation of each other's faults and sinfulness and weaknesses and warts, we've been, conf we've been comforted and strengthened in the knowledge that we are one flesh, one body. G.K. Chesterton captured this when he wrote to his fiancée, Frances, 
Here ends my previous existence. Take it. It led me to you. This journey together has given rise to mutual words of encouragement, especially when the going gets tough, as it sometimes does. Stick with me, sweetheart, I would say. And Therese would respond, to whom shall I go? <laughs> you are mine, my love. Yes, I am yours forever. And over the 33 years of our life together, basing our marriage on these two pillars, fidelity and openness to life, has been to us a great treasure. Like a new set of eyes, it has allowed us to penetrate the other's personhood, soul and body. What has been revealed speaks of awe and mystery, and we say, thank you, God, for you have given us more than we could ever imagine. We were married on May 1st, 1976, the feast of St. Joseph the Worker and the first Saturday in the Marian month of May. Eleven months later, our first child was born. I remember very clearly the day we brought him home from the hospital, carrying him up the three flights of stairs to our tiny apartment. Mike was finishing his undergraduate degree in biology. He would start medical school the following fall. We were as poor as could be. I remember the two of us unbundling our tiny child and crying with joy and awe as we pondered him. Like every other mother and father of every age, we looked upon that which we had made with God and saw that it was very good. Many children were to follow, and each has evoked in us the same awe, the same realization that they are truly gift, unique and unrepeatable. Will you accept children lovingly and willingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church. The celebrant posed this question to us during the rite of marriage, as it is posed to every couple. I was aware as I answered yes, that we stood before a great mystery, before the very creative power of God. We had entered this covenant with a deep desire to live it in truth and love, to give ourselves to each other totally, and to accept each other totally. We sensed that our conjugal union needed to reflect that desire and speak that truth. We understood that this total gift of self, most evident in our physical union as one flesh, implied an openness to life which would likely result in us having and raising a large family. Conjugal union implies a special responsibility, we are told by Pope John Paul. Therese and I were led to understand that we were called to cooperate in this mystery of creation, bringing into existence a new human person, not merely a body, but a person, bearing the divine image and likeness and de destined like us for eternal life. Now, with our first child, we stood face to face with this great mystery, hidden in the form of a tiny child, which we experienced even then as a gift and as a blessing. There are, as the world so often reminds us, many difficulties and burdens associated with these gifts of life. There are moments, many in fact, when the wonder and awe of their creation is eclipsed by the weariness of daily challenges. Children are a formidable responsibility. They impose great demands upon us. Every mother, when holding that newborn baby in her arms, understands that the ability to give life is an awesome privilege and that her child is a tremendous blessing. Few experiences bring us closer to the God of the universe who condescended to take on the nature of man. Few experiences permit us to, to glimpse the love he has for us, like the love a mother and father feel for their child. And yet, we experience this blessing also as a burden, because giving life demands that we die to ourselves. In our fallen condition, it is hard to serve others in preference to ourselves, to be a gift to others. At times, 
the demands have seemed overwhelming. I have come face to face with my own deficiencies and my own sinfulness. Our children have a way of holding up a mirror to us. Raising them reveals our flaws as few other experiences do. I am conscious that at times I have failed them and it has caused harm. But in spite of our frailties, in spite even of our failure to fully appreciate the sublime blessing our children are, God continues to work in our depths, using our simple fidelity as the basis for building a great love for him and each other, in our hearts and in our homes. Fidelity, true faithfulness, is the foundation of a true love, love of God, love of neighbor, particularly love of spouse. We live in a milieu awash with suggestive messages and pro uh, provocative images. Our society is particularly adept at presenting sex in a most dehumanized manner. Young men are taught that a woman's body is an object to be exploited for personal pleasure. Young women learn that men cannot be trusted to love and to protect. Jesus proposes a different view. He says, as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This level of faithfulness can seem an impossibility. It must have to the disciples of Jesus who first heard it and who are known to say at times, who then can be saved? In the beginning, it seemed so to me. But little by little, I began to see that this call to faithfulness in marriage is a call to purity. All that was required of me was the desire to acquire it and trust in the healing and transforming power of Christ. Jesus condemns lust as wrong, but more importantly, he reveals that it is possible to love with a pure heart. We can love faithfully but only with the love of his heart, which he gives us through the graces of the sacraments, and particularly the sacrament of matrimony. Purity gives us eyes to see the total person. As my relationship with Therese has deepened through the years, I see more completely and more clearly the person she is and the person she has become. I see her beauty, her goodness, and yes, her imperfections but even these as an integral part of her personhood. I can say with my whole heart that there's nothing more beautiful than my bride, my little girl, to whom I give my total fidelity. How utterly beautiful this gift, how it summons from me the gift of myself. It is no accident that Christ chose to begin his ministry at a wedding feast at Cana. There he poured out his divine life like wine, sanctifying and transforming the vocation of marriage into a sacrament. From the beginning, to be sure, matrimony had grandeur and dignity. With Christ, the excellence of marriage in the natural order is transformed into something infinitely greater, a sacrament. Married love becomes the very means by which divine life is infused into the souls of the spouses. The significance of this call is humbling. Mike and I are to be nothing less than Christ to each other, and this in the ordinary tasks of life. Little wonder that the Holy Father draws our attention to, the, to St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, which he so aptly christens a hymn to love, and the Magna Carta of a civilization of love. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous nor rude. It does not put on airs. Love does not seek itself nor brood over injuries. Love rejoices in the truth, trusts all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The commission here concerns the smallest and most intimate details of daily living. Here, love is at its grandest. And here, too, 
we are at our most frail. Man cannot find himself except through the sincere gift of self. How many times Mike and I have struggled to be gifts to each other, to be patient and kind and encouraging and enduring, how many times we fail. We are, after all, fallen creatures in need of redemption, and it is true, there is much in the daily struggle that is difficult and wearisome. Yet there are moments, many moments, in the course of very ordinary days that I become aware and see clearly the sublime gift that Mike is to me. Sometimes it is in the very smallest things, like when he brings me coffee in the morning or starts my car in the cold. Sometimes it is a word, a gesture, a touch, a look. In those moments, the treasure, usually hidden beneath the busyness and burdens of daily life, obscured by laundry or dishes or legal files, in those moments, the treasure becomes visible. The radiance of the gift, the great mystery of our union, shines with a brilliance that blots out the mundaneness of ordinary life. In those moments, I find myself astonished at his goodness. I comprehend how much he loves me, and I love him with all my heart. In this love, freely given, our conjugal covenant is redeemed day by day, year by year. By it, we transform the other, and we are transformed. The beauty of the gift, like the realization of our weakness, has many times brought us to our knees. Early in our marriage, we began to attend Mass daily. Not long after, we began to say the rosary together every day. Mass, the rosary, morning prayer, grace before meals, regular confession. These became the pillars upon which we hung our daily work. This was not always easy. Getting little ones up and ready to go to an early morning Mass or gathering everyone together for the rosary often took great effort and tested the limited capacity of their parents for patience. But little by little, what began as a discipline has become a deep joy and a consolation. I cannot put into words how vital this has been to us. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, drinking in the words of eternal life, nourished by him daily with his very body and blood, touched by him with his healing touch. How many times we found ourselves saying, Lord, create a new heart within me, a heart after yours. Lord, if you but will it, you can make me whole. And how often we have in these daily and in many ways very ordinary encounters heard him answer us. Of course I will it. Be healed. I will remove your heart of stone and put within you a heart of flesh. We are aware that over time, prayer and the sacraments have transformed our family, bringing about a deep communion of persons and preparing us to ride out into the world as witnesses to life. Families, you are Gaudium et Spes, joy and hope. Pope John Paul II exclaimed this, and he challenged us to become what we are. And just what are we? Nothing less than this, bearers of a new springtime of hope and a true civilization of love. Yet our society is a tragic irony. Words such as freedom, sincere gift, person, and even love no longer convey their essential meaning. Saturated with pornography and other forms of sexual exploitation and manipulation, people are nevertheless desperately searching for true meaning and real love. And without the guidance of a formed conscience and mature judgment, they are extremely vulnerable to counterfeits. One of the saddest features of our time is that true love, love freely given, has been recast as free love. Real love places demands upon us. It requires that we give ourselves. 
but modern sensibilities rebel at the notion of self-sacrifice. It seeks a love severed from responsibility, a quote, free love. What it finds is neither free nor love. Turned in on itself, it cannot find itself. Rejecting responsibility, it loses the ability to respond. It becomes isolated and embittered. Mike is a psychiatrist, and I am a family law lawyer. Both of us have witnessed the terrible pain and catastrophic loss of hope that follows in the wake of such a lifestyle, both for the person who embraces it and the victims they leave behind. We are called to be gaudium et spes, joy and hope to this wounded generation. Do not be conform conformed to the world, St. Paul counsels us in his letter to the Romans. The call to holiness, which is a call to each of us in our particular vocations, is always a call to a kind of opposition. Living our vocation with fidelity, generosity, and tenderness, we will be for the world signs of both contradiction and promise. On our wedding day, we received a gift from an older and wiser couple, a painting which still hangs in our home. It depicts two children, a boy and a girl, crossing a grassy me meadow together towards a small boat beached on the shore. Behind it, the glittering waters stretch to a distant horizon under a vaguely threatening sky. We've often reflect upon it, remembering how young and trusting and full of expectation we were when we set out on our journey together. We are keenly aware that, unlike the lives of many we know, we have not encountered great storms. God has, in his infinite mercy, and no doubt because of our incapacity, spared us great trials to this point. Ours have been little crosses, sometimes many little crosses, and we don't always carry those well. Though we cannot say what lies ahead, We've come to know that the God who teaches us to be faithful and tender and generous with each other will continue to do so with us. Whatever he asks of us, he will be there with us. Striving to live our vocation in truth and love, we will draw many graces from the living water, and this will be for us the source of profound and enduring happiness. Already here and now, we've begun to taste the peace the world cannot give. As the psalmist says, like a fruitful vine, your wife within your home, like olive shoots, your children around your table, just so will they be blessed who fear the Lord. And now, our olive shoots are producing olive shoots of their own. <laughs> the love our children have for one another has been a source of great joy for Therese and me even more so as we watch our married children and their spouses truly cherish one another and as they welcome their own children. But it is my bride, the one to whom I gave my heart, who's my greatest source of happiness. With the author of Song of Songs, I say, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one bead of your necklace, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. There is nothing more beautiful than to encounter Christ in the person of another, in her body and soul. To all who have embraced this beautiful vocation, may you be granted the grace to live it faithfully, generously, and tenderly. Finally, we pray that our humble reflections tonight may be a little salt and light for you in your encounter with Jesus Christ. Now taught by our Savior's command and formed by the word of God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from us. Gracious God, watch over us and keep us in the light of your presence. May our praise continually blend with that of all creation until, until we come together to the eternal joy which you promise in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. May God the Father Almighty bless us and keep us. Amen. May Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, graciously smile upon us. May the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, grant us peace. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Offer one another now a sign of Christ's peace. peace be with you.